Where did we get to before you lost me? Uh, we we got to you were talking you were talking about the 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 um, the SSR. You'd basically just sort of started. You, you'd you'd mentioned it was a transponder or a score code thing as well. So we okay. So it was this. We were still. We it was at least this slide. Is, you know, I, before I spotted that we had lost you all. <laughs> exactly. Oh, don't uh, worry. I've, I've I've actually disappeared twice during this session. My session completely shut out twice already. So it's it's. Oh, okay. And I'm and I'm on a high speed. I'm on a high speed fiber line. So I'd have no yeah, clue too. what's going on. Yeah. Every everyone okay. stop streaming Netflix. It's not time for Netflix. Yes. Wow. Well, all right. That, does that really say 173? But anyway, um, right. Yes. Yeah, so I got as far as uh, squawks, and I right, and I'm just coming on to DME, distance measuring equipment. So this is the other application aeronautical navigation aid nav aid that uses the band um so in reality it's not 960 to 1164 it's it's actually three sub bands 961 to 1015 1045 to 1075 and 1105 to 1154 as i say would be great uh one if one day this band caught on it takes and it's going to take a lot of persuading the aeronautical community that this is actually a good idea because they kind of regard this band as their own um but in practice in those three bands with with some uh clever coordination and people doing the right thing and obeying the rules it would be perfectly safe and it could potentially be worldwide however that's kind of for the future um but just but as i say keep on in touch with you keep on top of your local regulator wherever you are in the world because there are always other bands being looked at and they to be honest unless you keep on with them they will quietly forget that our industry exists because they're very good at hiding what we do um in many ways it's kind of part of the job for a lot of people and uh, they won't realize that we need spectrum if we don't keep telling them this is one of the documents I was going to try and share with you. Uh, we'll still try and do that somehow before we finish, I guess. Um, this is a frequency matrix that needs a little bit of an update in one area, but um, it shows all the different models that Sennheiser currently offer of wireless microphone equipment and all the different bands that they operate in. And as you can see, there's quite a lot. Um, anything in grey, light or dark grey, on the right of the slide uh, is spectrum that we can't generally use or won't be able to use quite soon in, uh, in region one, which is Europe and Africa, uh, where I'm sitting. Sadly, I don't have equivalents of this document for regions two and three. Um, I don't know if they exist, but I don't have them. So uh, but what you can see on there is we've got all of those different UHF devices, some of which are analog, some of which are digital, not something I was going to go into today, but possibly worth just mentioning that just because something is digital it doesn't give you any clue as to which frequency band it operates in, similarly analog. So we have analog equipment operating in the 1.8 gigahertz band, for example. If I get my arrow cursor to come over here. This is the 1.8 gigahertz band here. And we have analog equipment in the form of Evolution G4 these days in there. And uh, not to be confused with the DEX band, which is 1.9 gigahertz here. Remember I said there are five different versions of DEX technology, depending on where you are in the world. The whole of Europe uses the same type, and so do a lot of other countries. Um, then there's other bits that we can use in here, like the duplex gap in the 800 megahertz band available across all of Europe, and the um, short range device band 863 to 865 here. But we're predominantly operating below 694 megahertz in, in Europe now moving forward because the 800 megahertz band got sold for mobile phone use and the 700 megahertz band is being cleared and will be sold if it hasn't already been depending on where you are in Europe and uh, really the point of this was particularly to point out to a UK audience that there is rather more available in the way of equipment and spectrum than just dear old channel 38 at the top there uh, why are we trying to cram everything into that all the time 
when we have all these other options because that's just creating trouble and really it is about selecting the right tool for the job so for example the deck technology is fantastic it's very user friendly but it isn't necessarily the right thing for every job and the same applies to any particular technology you care to name they're all just tools and it's if you understand how they work and the best one for the job you're going to get the best results um, so that's as I said, somewhat uk centric if we want to know more about spectrum that's available around the world can i please draw your attention to what we call CIFA, Sennheiser International Frequency Advisor. And uh, this is a good place to look to find out what the regulatory position, what spectrum is available uh, in different parts of the world. It doesn't have everything because some territories are not very good at giving us the information. Uh, some regulators are more helpful than others, for example. But uh, at the very bottom of the page, you go to that page, the Sennheiser International Frequency Advisor page. Um, it's available from any of the Sennheiser web pages, not just the UK one, but that link should be reliable there. Um, if you go to the very bottom of that page, it does actually uh, have the name and uh, contact details for a company called Mission Control, whose um, mission if you like it is to uh, assist people with difficult licensing problems in different in, in various territories so if you need help with that they can um they can help for a fee it's not a free service by any means uh, the, the service they offer but uh, so first thing is to have a look at the international Frequency advisor see if the information you need is there if you're still struggling maybe get in touch with mission control brings me rather belatedly to topic number two where does it all go wrong i said at the beginning um and part two is coaxial cable if we've chosen the right frequencies to use and as you've seen there are lots of options uh, in terms of the technology and different frequency usage coaxial cable is the next thing on our hit list for where it all goes wrong and where it all goes wrong is to do with the amount of attenuation of the signal we get uh, between if we're talking about wireless mics we're talking about between the antenna and the receiver uh, if we're talking about IEM systems personal monitor systems then we're talking about the loss between the transmitter and the antenna in either case the attenuation along the length of our coaxial cable is, is our enemy and needs to be managed Now, all the cable we're talking about in, in our world of wireless mics and IEMs, is all 50 ohm coaxial cable. We don't want, the first thing we don't want to be doing is using 75 ohm cable. So just because it has a BNC connector on it, um, and it's coaxial cable doesn't make it suitable for our purposes. And that's because of the amount of attenuation it's going to involve. So the first thing we can do uh, wherever possible is minimize the length. Quite often when people are saying, where should I put the antennas, Andy, uh, for this room? I will often say, well, put them wherever, give you the shortest cable run back to the receiver or the shortest cable run from the transmitter to the antenna. Because quite honestly, the radio waves would far sooner go through air than through cable. So minimizing the cable length is, is, is usually fairly critical. There's always exceptions, but usually, Minimize the cable length. Um, using the right type of cable, this is really critical as well. Um, we've got to choose the right type. It's got to be 50 ohm, as I said, but there are, as you'll see in a minute, many, many different types of 50 ohm cable out there. And it's as easy to choose the wrong one as it is. And it's probably easier to choose the wrong one than the right one, quite honestly. Um, so which, which type of 50 ohm cable do we want? is really what it comes down to. Um, the image on the screen is a type of cable called RG1, uh, RG213. Uh, it's about 10 mil in diameter. As you can see there, it has a, 
a solid dielectric. The dielectric is the bit that separates the inner and outer, this bit here, and it's solid in the RG213. The center core is stranded. There are seven cores there, in the seven strands in that center core, which means actually it's relatively flexible as a cable. It also means if you coil it and uncoil it uh, to use it on events, it will survive many, many times of coiling and uncoiling. If you pick a cable of similar construction, but with a solid center core, so only one strand in its center core, after about the third time you've coiled and uncoiled it, you'll end up having to remake the ends. At least one of the ends will have come adrift from its center pin. Uh, cables that have a, a type number starting RG indicate they have been made to a US government specification. So regardless of the manufacturer, they should conform to that, to that spec. The other major type group that you see is ones that begin with UR or URM and that's another sort of uh, um, internationally recognized spec where no matter who made it, it should follow that particular specification. Beyond that, we get into cables that are unique to a particular manufacturer. So typically for any coaxial cable, we're going to see a graph a chart that looks a bit like this with frequency along the bottom increasing frequency from left to right and attenuation in decibels going up the the, the side and the figures are normally given in db per 100 meters or uh, sometimes in db per 100 feet which is a bit of a pitfall to watch for um, but that means that looking at this graph <coughs> as we go up the chart we're getting higher levels of attenuation, so we're losing more signal. So up the chart is bad and down is good. And basically the way to look at this, if we look at RG58, probably the most common type of coaxial, 50 ohm coaxial cable out there. Very friendly cable, 5.5 millimeters in diameter, very flexible um, and available pretty much anywhere in the world. Again, it's got a uh, stranded center and a solid dielectric and it's nice and small and flexible. Very useful type of cable. Um, but you can see that's the sort of attenuation figures we can expect increasing quite dramatically from left to right. Um, so the one that was on the first slide there, RG213, um, has rather lower attenuation at any given frequency as you can see it's further down the line is down the chart so that's lower levels of attenuation so we're going to get more of our expensive signal um, reaching the other end of the cable if we use rg213 compared to 58. to put some numbers on it if we're if we were looking at 800 megahertz um, we're going to lose 50 dbs five zero along 100 meters of rg58 but only 25 along the same length of rg213 at 800 megahertz um, that's a big difference 50 db basically is don't bother plugging it in there's no signal getting from one end to the other worth mentioning if it's 50 db of attenuation and we can't really sensibly dig you out of that one with some boosters um, because Boosters are typically 10 to 15 dB, so even if we put two of them in, we're still only going to get 30 dB back. 50 dB of loss is you've wasted your money on the cable. Um, if we put in RG213 on a 100 meter run, it's just about possible to rescue that with a couple of boosters. It's not the ideal scenario. Maybe we should have used a lower loss cable still, but it's just about possible to rescue that. Um, now, as you can also see, very important on that slide, the, the, the increase in attenuation up frequencies beyond the UHF band. I was pointing out bands at 1.8 gigahertz and, and, and DECT technology in 1.9 gigahertz. You can see how that line, those lines slope up. We're looking, if we're heading all on the way to two gigahertz here, the attenuation figures are even less healthy um, and so we really, really need to be ultra careful with our cable specifications and our cable lengths if we're operating at 1.8 or 1.9 gigahertz or even potentially higher frequencies one day in the future. 
Uh, we really, really need to watch those cable specs. So for example, I mentioned, you know, that there are lower loss cables than either of these. Ecoflex 15 being an example, similar to uh, LMR 600. So these are uh, part numbers that are unique to particular manufacturers. So you have to seek them out. LMR 600 by times microwave in the US. Ecoflex 15 comes from a company in Germany. Uh, the 15 in the name gives you a clue. It's 15 mil in diameter. It's quite big. But as you can see there, we're only looking at 9 dB per 100 meters of attenuation at 800 megahertz. So a much lower loss cable. Obviously a lot less flexible. Uh, it's got a semi-airspaced construction. So if you kink it or crush it, basically you need to cut it and turn it into two shorter cables or put it in the bin. Um, whereas the, the RG58 so this world and the RG213s with their solid dielectric tend to live to fight another day um, a bit more. So the, the more exotic lower loss cables do tend to be a bit more fragile. Um, so here's a list, it's by no means comprehensive of, uh, of all the different cables, a lot of different cables, I should say, um, all 50 ohm types. What you will notice is the general pattern is that the thicker the cable, the lower the loss. There is an exception on that chart. GZL5000 in the middle there uh, is a cable that's got dimensions roughly the same as RG58, but it's got uh, attenuation figures broadly similar to RG213. It's a cable that's specially made for Sennheiser. If it's GZL5000, it's got BNC plugs on the end. If it's GZL9000, it'll have N-type connectors on the end but it's the same type of cable, just, just, but it's supplied with, uh, in, in pre-made lengths with connectors already fitted. Um, so yeah, it's, as I said before, uh, dB per 100 meters is usual way of specifying cable loss. If it's in dB per 100 feet, it can make you think you found the holy grail of cable because of course the attenuation figures will be that much less since the foot is about a third of a meter. So just beware. Uh, and the one to watch out for, and because we've had a couple of cases fairly recently where people have installed their wireless systems, and of course, what happens? They ring up these wireless systems, these soldiers don't work. Um, and yes, people have put in 50 meter plus lengths of 50 ohm coaxial cable, and when you quiz them, they've used RG174. Understandable, it's nice and thin, but basically if you use more than a 30 centimeter one foot length of that um it's not what it's intended for it's designed to be used in inside equipment it's not at all suitable uh, so you have to choose the right cable for the job is basically what i'm saying here and as i said be, do be particularly careful uh at higher frequencies at 1.8 gigahertz if you want a rule of thumb um, to, to work with. With RG58, I recommend not using more than five meters or 15 feet as a maximum length for RG58. Uh, for RG213, 20 meters or 60 feet uh, is, a, is a good maximum length. Beyond both of those, we, we definitely need to use boosters or we need to consider using a lower loss cable. Uh, so five meters for RG58, 20 meters for RG213, um, and then look for something lower loss beyond that. And as I said, about 30 centimeters maximum for RG174, um, best avoided really. Which brings me to the third topic. Um, which is interference. This is the third thing that breaks your radio system most commonly. Um, so the first thing I want to say about interference, uh, since about a year ago in this country, um, and for slightly longer in a few other places, this thing's been around. 
5G. And understandably, um, there's a lot of marketing around it. So people naturally made the lamental leap when they just heard that ad advertisement on the radio saying, 5G is here, and they've just had an interference problem. But it's not surprising they make the mental leap that these two things are somehow connected. Um, but they're not. Um, let's make that go away again. Right. Um, yeah, this is the sort of advertising that we've been seeing in the UK, and it's understandable. Um, but I call that, you know, hearing hoofbeats from looking for zebras. 5G is not your interference problem. Unless you're using some frequencies that you definitely shouldn't be, um, then 5G is not your problem. Here's why. These are the bands that have been uh, allocated or awarded for 5G around the world so far. And uh, the, the lowest band currently uh, being used for 5G technology in most parts of the world is this 3.4 to 3.6 gigahertz band. 5G technology doesn't really get interesting and exciting until they start using these so-called millimeter bands up in the 26 uh, gigahertz region. That's when 5G really gets interesting. But as you can see, there's nothing anywhere near currently any of the frequencies that we use. Um, so yes, one day 5G technology in the 700 megahertz band will be a thing, but in fact, most 700 megahertz use uh, will be 4G, not 5G in the early days. So let's have a look at what, if, if 5G isn't the problem, then what is? Let's have a look at some of the things that can cause interference. Um, so I turned up to site one day, a site where they were having problems. They'd used the same radio equipment for some years. And uh, it's a seasonal location. They don't operate all year round. They'd come back to start the new season and they had an interference problem they hadn't had the previous year. I went on site to have a look and this is what the spectrum analyzer showed me. And uh, this is without the wireless mics on. So there's quite a lot of interference from something. And you might think, well, okay, let's replan the frequencies and maybe put the wireless mics in these gaps between the peaks of interference. There's only one slight problem with that, which is if, I don't know if that's gonna play, oh, it did, excellent. Um, it's a video and the frequencies where the interference are, are constantly in, move, in motion. It's changing all the time. So we can't just go in the gaps. We're gonna have to find the source of the problem. So we did what we, do in this situation, we started turning things off, pulling the power, and uh, eventually we found this. Um, it's a switch box that fires a confetti cannon. That's all it does. Makes something go bang and lots of confetti appear. And uh, it's basically just a power supply in a box. But it was producing all that interference. And once we removed the mains power supply to it, the problem went away. Um, and of course, at that point, everybody realized that that was new this year. They hadn't had that there the previous year, so the clue was there. What has changed? Don't be looking for things that are meant to be wireless, necessarily. First thing I always say is anything powered by electricity can be a source of interference, and I mean anything. Anything at all powered by electricity can be a source of interference. Even if it's a small battery powered thing, it's still possibly a source of interference. Uh, this, this box is connected to about 100 meters of armored cable that runs off across the field to where the confetti cannon is. Which, and that 100 meters of cable acts as a fantastic antenna, incidentally. I mean, this box should not be producing wireless signals, has no business producing an interference, but it does. Um, exhibit two is a refrigerator, a fridge. It does look a little bit worse for wear, um, but it actually does its job as a refrigerator perfectly well. It keeps the contents nice and cold. Uh, it, this actually lives uh, on stage in a theatre, not on stage, at the side of the stage, I should say, in a theatre for a West End show. Um, 
It keeps the food and drink that is served to the actors on stage during the show cold so that they don't get food poisoning, which is desirable um, for them not to get food poisoning. And uh, anyway, it was I, I, we identified this as the source of the interference to their wireless mics. The wireless mic receivers are about two metres from the refrigerator, um, about two metres away. And the clue, one of the clues was that they had noticed that the incidence of uh, interference had got worse during the summer months when the weather got warmer and had got better as the weather cooled down again. Uh, that was one of the clues. In the end, the solution was, I mean, the first proposed solution, once we identified it, was to put the fridge in the skip and get a new fridge. But um, we were able to save the refrigerator, give it a reprieve because there were some other contributory factors. They had 75 ohm coaxial cable connecting one of the antennas. They had transmitters that were on various different power settings um, and didn't, weren't, hadn't realized they had incorrect antennas on some of the transmitters, the wrong length antennas. Um, so by the time we'd sorted out all those problems, oh, and they had active antennas with far too much gain turned it up. They were set to 15 dB of gain uh, when five would have been more than enough to overcome the cable length. So by the time we dealt with those three things, four things, put the right antennas on all the transmitters, turned the powers to all the same setting, turned the gain down on the receiving antenna and got rid of the 75 ohm cable, then the interference from the fridge was no longer a significant factor and they could uh, get through the shows without anybody suffering noticeable interference. So, uh, just to reiterate, anything powered by electricity can cause interference, which brings us to exhibit number three. Uh, here we see the displays of some uh, EM6000 receivers. If we watch the RF meters when I hit play, um, here we have the LED toy that is sold to the audience in vast numbers. And that's just one of them. And there you can see the interference on the meters of the receivers. Now they sell 400 of those per show to the audience. So they're actually selling the source of the interference to the audience. So as I say, and that's just powered by two AA batteries. As you can see, any one of them is more than enough to cause interference to the wireless mics. Uh, that's just a, a selection. We, I have more, but not in this presentation. Um, as I said, there is lots more that can cause you problems. Um, so much more, and we don't have time to go into it today. We, we haven't touched on intermodulation. We haven't talked about digital versus analog. Um, we haven't talked about RF splitters or combiners or antennas or boosters. These are things we do normally cover on our wireless essentials course. Um, my colleagues over the next few days are going to be, next few days and weeks, are going to be presenting other courses that will go into a lot more detail. And um, the place to find out about these things, I guess, is the Sound Academy website. And if John's still with us, maybe he can tell us a little more about that and the other offerings. Yeah, well, we're, it's, it won't be actually on the, the Sound Academy website, but it will be coming up on the main pro audio site of the Sennheiser website, full stop. <laughs> Um, we are just in the final stages of getting everything scheduled in. Uh, I know the schedule. I'm not going to repeat it because things may change. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, what Andy's just said, this idea of the wireless essentials course, uh, which is normally a face-to-face -face course uh, with some online portions to it. We are looking at the potential of making that completely online over the next couple of weeks. Um, there will be um, a big eight-week special um, from um, from our boss, Mr. Folger Schmidt, talking about digital RF for those of you that are moving over to that world. So keep keep an eye on on, on your emails and keep an eye on on the uh, Sennheiser website. Uh, there will be uh, lots and lots and lots of training coming up. Uh, it looks like we're basically going to be doing uh, three sessions a day. Uh, for the foreseeable future uh, and sometimes three sessions at the same time of different subjects. Uh, so you will find something to keep you occupied and you will find something that uh, hopefully uh, will, will be a useful um, segue during this um, uh, this interesting period of sitting at home and getting to know our wives and children much better. 
So I would say thank you, Andy, for that. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, some questions have been popping in, and I'm not sure if you can see them yet, Andy, but I'll also say to the guys, um, please feel free to put them in the Q&A section uh, or put them in the chat function, but there are a few in both at the very, very first time. So, uh, Andy, if you see those, do you want to start, maybe read them out? And, uh, and you can see uh, the one in the Q&A section. You can probably see that. Um, uh, seems to be the same question twice from two different people. It's amazing. Um, and yes, we can certainly uh, talk about that very quickly. Yes, uh, if you put the booster at the at the receiving end of the cable, so the question being, does using a booster raise the noise floor in a cable? You should only use enough boost to overcome the loss in the cable, I think is the first thing to say. Um, but if you put the booster at the receiving end of the cable, then there is a danger that you boost any noise picked up along the cable. That's the other reason to choose your cable type very carefully um, and why it should be 50 ohm, not 75, because everything in your system is 50 ohm, your receiver is 50 ohm, generally your antenna is going to be 50 ohm. So if you have a correct match, you're less likely to pick up noise along the length of your cable. But yes, putting the booster at the receiving end rather than the antenna end um, can potentially boost the noise that you're picking up and that's the other also why you don't need more use more boost than the minimum because all you end up doing is boosting but well, even when you do put it at the correct end of the cable you'll just end up boosting any interference or noise um, and not necessarily boosting your wanted signal by any in any useful way um, So it looks like there's more questions coming in there. Yeah, I got one quick one, which was interesting. Oh. I saw in the chat function, and I'm sorry if we don't get all to, to all of them before you leave, but I hope we do. Um, this one was, and I'm sure you probably see it in the chat function. It's slightly further down. It goes, uh, and it's a little bit confusing. So bear with me as I as I as I read it out. Uh, talking about um, antenna boosters, uh, using an external booster um, is it the best fix? Uh, is it best to fix it near the antenna fin or near to the receiver splitter end? Uh, and on the IM application, is the advice uh, to use antenna booster when running long cable from transmitter to antenna? If not, what's the solution in case of using uh, mm. an A5000 a mm. CP? Okay, so yes, it is best to put the, the, the generally best to put the booster at the antenna end of the cable in a receiving situation uh, that is the general best advice sometimes when we have to use two boosters you put one at either end of the cable but if you put them both immediately at one after the other then you risk overloading the second one um, but generally try and avoid using two boosters in the first place and then use one and put it at the antenna end is the normal way of doing it and that is the best thing and then as i said if it's got an adjustable gain only put in enough gain to overcome the loss of the cable. As far as boosters and IEMs are concerned, since somebody has asked, um, generally speaking, A, there are no off-the-shelf boosters for IEM systems. So if you, you know, buy an antenna booster uh, from Sennheiser, it'll have been designed to be used for a wireless mic. It is not going to work on your IEM system. Generally speaking, boosting of IEM systems is not something you want to get into. Uh, it's very easy to do it badly and cause problems for the whole of your RF environment. Uh, it's very expensive to do it well for a whole host of reasons we haven't got time to go into today, but we can probably cover in other sessions. Uh, so basically the only solution with IEMs is to get the transmitter as close to the antenna as you possibly can and use the lowest loss cable over the shortest length. Bear in mind, you know, IEM transmitters these days have pretty much all got an Ethernet connection. You can monitor them via software, WSM or, uh, you know, other software of the brands. Uh, so you can see what their transmitters are doing without having them right next to the monitor engineer. Um, and so better usually to give the audio the long trip to the transmitter um, and, and have a short cable run to the antenna, particularly as somebody's mentioned, A5000CP, um, circular polarised antenna, another topic we haven't had time for today. 
I'm going to I'm going to be slightly cruel and cut off the Q and A because we, we have run out of time. However, for those of you that have stuck questions uh, into the Q and A, uh, I have your details. I have the questions, um, and what I will do is I will um, uh, send uh, these to Andy, uh, and we'll get you direct answers yourselves. Um, I just want to do because there's a lot of chats coming in about the mm. the, the next courses, uh, so I just want to highlight that um, there was a question from India about uh, is the Sound Academy available in India? Um, I believe it is. Um, if not, uh, I'm going to give out my personal email address. That's always a good way to do it. Uh, it's John McGregor, so that's M C G R E G O R at Sennheiser.com. Email me directly, uh, and I'll find out with the guys at Sennheiser India what is and what isn't available on their website. But it should be, so don't worry about that. Uh, yeah, the courses at the present time are free. Of course, they're free. We're not going to uh, we're not going to charge anyone during these times, um, and there will be a, a, a hell of a lot more coming out over the next couple of days. So, um, uh, some courses will be repeated. So, Andy is going to be online again twice again today doing this course. Yay. So, once <laughs> once I think it was, was it one thirty and six o'clock, isn't it today? At least in German time. So, yeah. twelve twelve thirty and four uh, five o'clock UK time. So, so Andy will be back with us twice more today. So if you did join us late, um, you know, you, you still have the opportunity to uh, to catch the beginning of a session and, and hopefully both of our internet connections. I can't are promise. Amazing. I can't promise exactly <laughs> the same script every time, but, well, you know. Uh, well, I'm also, I'm also wondering about the six o'clock one, five o'clock Netflix time comes on, everyone's turning their computers <laughs> on. Not just in the UK, but around the world, it's going to be yeah. an interesting one. Um, but I want to say, first of all, thank you very much to Andy for joining us. It was great. And I shall see you a little later this afternoon. Great. And more importantly, I want to say thank you to all of you who spent time with us this morning. Uh, we hope it was useful. Um, we hope you stay healthy. Uh, and I've seen lots of encouraging messages in there. Yeah, we, th th this is a tough time, guys. But we will get through this and we will get back out onto the road again. And we will, uh, we will hopefully actually be able to meet up in person. Um, so uh, do keep in touch with us. Uh, I did give out my email address there. So uh, feel free to bombard me. Uh, there's a good way. Not that my email box is, is, uh, is full enough already, but please do keep in touch with us. Um, and you know, if, if, uh, if, you, if you think of something interesting as far as training goes, uh, well, that brings me to the poll. Um, so if you get a chance, please fill in this poll. We've got a few uh, things in there around about uh, further trainings that we're thinking of doing, but also please feel free to, to email me um, and I will quite happily forward those on. Other than that, I will wish you a great rest of the day. Stay healthy, stay strong, and more importantly, drink single malt whiskey if that is your thing, because that's definitely going to keep me happy. Have a great day, guys. Best of luck. <laughs> Bye, everybody.